Hello, my name is Marek Skulimowski. I'm the president and executive director of the Kościuszko Foundation. Welcome to the Kościuszko Foundation webinar on chemistry and biology of vision. This event is the part of the Kościuszko Foundation Collegium of Eminent Scientists event series. It was initially planned to take place at the foundation in March this year, but because of the pandemic, we decided to host it online. It is my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, an internationally renowned chemist, pharmacologist, and vision scientist, a member of the Collegium, Professor Krzysztof Palczewski, who agreed to give this talk today. I would also like to welcome two of the Foundation's trustees, both scientists who established the Collegium of Eminent Scientists of Polish Origin and Ancestry in uh, 2012 and have been its driving force since then, Dr. Zbigniew Darzynkiewicz and Dr. Hanna Chrobocza Kelker. I would also like to welcome all participants who registered for this webinar. Please know that you may ask any questions to Professor Palczewski using Q&A feature. These questions will be discussed after the lecture. And now I give this virtual floor to Dr. Zbigniew Darzynkiewicz, the chairman of the committee of the Collegium of Eminent Scientists. Eight years ago, the Kosciuszko Foundation established Collegium of Eminent Scientists of Polish origin and ancestry. The primary goals of these initiatives were, first, to identify, record, and catalog eminent Polish scientists and scientists of Polish descent residing in America who made significant contributions in their respective scientific fields. And second, to recognize, highlight, and publicize their achievements. Among other objectives was to establish a directory of eminent scientists that could be of help in developing mutual interactions between scientists of both countries. This directory will be an assistance to historians. Currently, there are over 460 names in the directory. Among distinguished scientists of the Collegium are four Nobel Prize winners, Andrew Shalley, Physiology and Medicine, Jack Strostak, also Physiology and Medicine, Roald Hoffman, Chemistry, and Frank Wilczek, Physics. Roald Hoffman and Frank Wilczek were already our invited speakers at the Collegium. Jack Shostak accepted the invitation and will be our guest this fall. Numerous Collegium affiliates are members of U.S. National Academy of Science and foreign members of PAN, Polish Academy of Science, or POW, Polish Academy of Learning. Between them, is the pioneer in field of molecular genetics, Wacław Szybalski, and cell biologist, Andrzej Barke, and Mariusz Ratajczak. The so-called Polish School of Mathematics, founded a century ago by Stefan Banak, Stanisław Ulam, and Kazimierz Uratowski, is represented by Tadeusz Iwaniec, Henryk Iwaniec, Krystyna Kuperberg, Andrzej Erenfund, and Jan Michielski. Several laureates of the Alfred Juzikowski Foundation Prize, also named the Polish Nobel, add to the Collegium prestige. Continuing the tradition commenced by Maria Skłodowska Curie, the Prize Nobel laureate in chemistry, many members of the Collegium are chemists. One of them is Krzysztof Matyaszewski creator of new branch of polymer chemistry and recipient of numerous international prizes and awards. He was our recent speaker at the Kosciuszko Foundation. Today we are pleased to have as a distinguished speaker, Professor Krzysztof Palczewski. He was already awarded with countless prizes for characterizing molecular structure or rhodopsin, the protein that is essential for eyesight. Dr. Hanna Hrobocek kelter will introduce him to us. On behalf of the Kosciuszko Foundation, it is my pleasure 
to welcome Professor Krzysztof Barczewski, a world-renowned vision scientist. His studies on determining the crystal structure, folding, and binding properties of rhodopsin, a light-sensitive photoreceptor protein, have had a profound impact on our understanding of the molecular basis of vision, as well as the structure of photoreceptor cells in the retina. His work on the visual cycle also has led to revolutionary advances in understanding inherited retinal degeneration and age-related macular degeneration. His work is also leading to identifying molecular therapies for treatment of inherited retinal diseases and treatment of many other retinal diseases leading to blindness. Dr. Krzysztof Barczewski started his scientific career in Poland. He received his doctorate in biochemistry from the Technical University of Wrocław. His early posts were in the United States. In 2018, he moved from his post of distinguished professor at Case Western Reserve University to the University of California, Irvine, where he is the chair in ophthalmology and a professor in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. Dr. Barczewski's team forms the core of the Center for Translational Vision Research at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. His contributions to science are widely recognized. He has published over 550 articles in scientific journals. His work has been cited over 48,000 times, and the citation impact of his publications is measured by age index is very high, over 117, indicating magnitude of his contribution. Dr. Barczewski holds 29 patents. In addition, he has received numerous prestigious awards and honors. Among them are the Bresley Award in Vision Scientists, the Beckman Argyros Award in Vision Research, and the Kazimierz Funk Natural Sciences Award from Piazza. Dr. Palczewski has been elected a foreign member of the Polish Academy of Arts and Sciences and recently became a member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, which is a great honor. I would like to add that he continues to collaborate with vision scientists in Poland. I am pleased to introduce Professor Krzysztof Palczewski, who will speak to us on chemistry and biology of vision. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me and uh, hopefully you will find this uh, rather light uh, talk about vision uh, interesting. And um, good afternoon to everybody and Dzień Dobry. Um, I still <coughs> speak, uh, I, I hope Polish uh, sufficiently. So let me start uh, with our center uh, that uh, we created here in Gavin Herbert. Uh, where we focus on a discovery that we have made over the years uh, um, into um, a translational research that uh, could lead to help in uh, restoring sight or uh, preventing degeneration in many of the ocular diseases. Uh, we're still looking for uh, support for the naming the center, uh, something more personal, and that hopefully will happen in the near future. Um, eye uh, is really a phenomenal uh, organ. Uh, it can come in a variety of different uh, shapes and, uh, and has a different property depending on the animal. And this is just a very uh, simple uh, uh, picture showing you how uh, evolutionary uh, the eye uh, changed and uh, it really served the purpose of the animal. It's extremely critical. Obviously, uh, we're more interested in humans, uh, where we have the uh, central part of the retina that contains uh, mostly cone cells and peripheral uh, retina that contains uh, mostly rods. And so there are diseases that are specific for those two photoreceptor cells, cone and rods, which could lead to blindness. But from most of the disease, unless it is trauma, uh, to the optic nerve, those diseases are progressive 
and the rate of progression of those diseases is uh, different depending on uh, circumstances of particular um, disease or mutation in a gene that uh, uh, form our visual system. The central part is the most critical because it allows us uh, to identify uh, faces, to identify small objects, is the highest acuity uh, part of the retina that enable us uh, to uh, navigate as well. Uh, peripheral, uh, peripheral retina uh, is also critical uh, uh, for the health of the retina in general and also for our vision at very dim illumination. Today, this is maybe a little bit less problem as we have artificial illumination that the peripheral retina um, play perhaps a little bit lesser role in our um, recognition of external world. The process how light is trans, uh, translated from physical stimuli into a biochemical stimuli is shown on this uh, picture where we have the uh, light going from um, outside and entering the eye through uh, pupil uh, goes through cornea and lens and then is transmitted down uh, to the back of the eye to retina where it's translated into biochemical set of events uh, that lead ultimately to electrical sig signal to brain and in brain the image is interpret and interpret in terms of the uh, structure in terms of colors uh, and all of those processes, uh, again, uh, utilize maybe one third of our brain uh, to uh, provide the physiology of our vision. So uh, I evolved earlier than brain and brain was kind of added on to interpret those visual uh, uh, stimuli uh, for our understanding of external world. Uh, retina is quite compact structure. It is part of the central nervous system. Uh, we could say it is simply part of the brain, but the uh, simplicity of the retina allow uh, many technical innovation to be applied to study those uh, uh, cells because they are uh, stratified in varieties of layers from photoreceptor layers where you have cone and rods an adjacent uh, pigmented cell, very important. And then you have other neurons, uh, but they are again beautifully structured in the retina. It's not uh, as complicated structure as uh, in the brain. What I uh, thought to do today is to play you a, a very uh, short movie, maybe uh, five minutes or so, uh, about uh, a perspective from a people, what we do, uh, from patients affected by the blinding disease and doctors who treat those blinding diseases. So let me play uh, uh, this short movie uh, to give you a flavor uh, for things we do. Let me interrupt for a moment. I think we don't, our participants can see the movie in the slides. Can we replay? Absolutely. Very quickly and again go back to our visual system that it can evolve in a variety of different ways. And I mentioned that about the uh, central part of the retina, which is uh, our fovea, the yellow spot that contains a very high concentration of cones, enable us uh, to have a high uh, acuity vision. And then we have the peripheral retina with rods uh, responsible for uh, detection of uh, virtually a single photon. So what we have here is the, is, is the instrument, if you will, um, that enable us to detect a single photon, so it couldn't be any more sensitive, that is detected by rods, to about 100 million of photons coming per second. And we can operate in this continuum of light illumination. And this is again happened because of the transmission of light through the front of the eye, a transparent part of the eye that uh, ultimately uh, uh, light is absorbed by back of the retina, uh, or back of the eye and the tissue called retina. And again, you have here rod and con, um, very specific cells that are uh, involved in translating this light signal that ultimately go to the ganglion cells and the ganglion uh, bundle uh, reaches to brain. And that's how the signal is transmitted. And so I mentioned to you that our purpose is to 
uh, understand how visual system works. And again, the physics and chemistry of this process is incredibly interesting, but it also how we can help uh, patients that are affected by blinding diseases. And so um, I will just play this movie again. Is that okay now? Running when I was 17, I just find running to be very therapeutic. I run to think. Um, it clears my head. I love being outside. And if it's the colors or the feel of the wind or kind of just go into a whole different place. I didn't learn to water ski until I was in my 30s. It's just a great way to stay fit and it's been a really fun thing. to know how our eye function, how it translates the light signal into a signal that brain can understand. And what are those fundamental processes? So part of my lab is studying this question, how it works, why those parts that we have in, in our retina, in our eye, are there? What is the purpose of that? actually eight years ago when I first noticed an issue. Um, I've always had really great vision up until that point, so I thought. But we were taking a spring break trip down to Florida with the kids and I was driving. We always would drive straight through and it was the middle of the night and I was like, God, my vision is just not right. Like there's something wrong and I thought, I just need glasses. But it wasn't until I actually met Chris Palczewski, um, you know, years later and was kind of describing what I was going through and it's basically a loss of central vision and it started in my right eye first, took a DNA test and that revealed that I have retinal dystrophy, which means I'm gradually losing my central vision in both eyes. For me to actually see folks in a room, um, see their actual faces is difficult. Everything kind of blacks out. I describe it as I see in a macro um, level, not a micro level. So I can see forms, you know, I, I can, my brain actually, I think connects the dots and, you know, I can then put the face together, you know, with the body. But for me to see faces is very difficult. One of my favorite things to do is read. And um, I can't read a book anymore. And like, I have a great library of books that I've read and um, I can't pick up a book and just read it. So um, that's been really hard. Um, if you can't see it, it's already very late in the disease. We wanted to find the condition that pre-disease and then you can stabilize those cells for much longer. There are many tools that are developed uh, over the last uh, decade or so, very sophisticated. But we wanted to add even another dimensionality into that. It's just like this functional imaging that we can pinpoint the defect in human eye uh, where there is no functional perception, there is no light, there are pathological changes. We wanted to know exactly where it happened. If you can postpone those that are generative processes for another two decades, that's virtually you have a cure. His work is really, really been important and it's not easily recognized how important it is. Dr. Polchewski's work discovered really, along with a few other people, a class of proteins called G-protein coupled receptors. And G proteins are essential proteins that are part of membranes. Now, why is that important? Because that's how cells talk to one another. Now, one of the most important of these G proteins is this molecule called rhodopsin. And rhodopsin is a, a key uh, protein that tells the cells of the eye 
and the photoreceptor, how to turn on and how to turn off. If we were to talk about the signs, it's frankly very complicated, but we can say that they don't give out the Nobel Prize for nothing. And it's this kind of discovery, the discovery of how these G proteins work and how they help cells talk to one another, cell signaling, that was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2012. He would often say that he was uh, going to cure blindness. And, you know, at first we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's like, you know, no, I've cured blindness in mice, and that's what I intend to do. Dr. Polchevsky's team tested low-dose combinations of four drugs and determined which regimen best protected mice from retinal damage caused by bright light. They also successfully teased apart the exact proteins and GPCRs activated or inactivated by the drugs. You start with many, many different ideas and then you triage them until you get to very few that you can test in humans. But you have to test in humans at the end. The restoring site in mice is very exciting, but you have to do it ultimately in humans. You're spending all your life trying to invent and find a way to cure for the disease. So it's quite a pressure that once you have the positive effects, you would like to carry it to the end. But you need to reflect whether everything has been done. So we bring solution rather than problems to patients suffering from blinding diseases. I just feel that, you know, folks like Chris, um, who are so brilliant in what they do and so dedicated and so committed, I am incredibly grateful. This disease is personal to me. My mother, uh, who passed away, but she had developed a very fiercely independent woman, and she developed uh, at the end of her life uh, age-related macular degeneration. I would like, before I will quit doing research, I would like to find a solution for this most common retina disease that really wraps people inside. And I think, I believe that this will happen. There's only one way, is to advance the research. We are on the cusp of those changes. This is not a dream. It's a question of next several months that this data will come. All right, so I hope this was a little entertaining to you. Uh, and uh, again, it boosts my ego for a few minutes uh, until it will come down where it's supposed to be. So let me tell you, uh, uh, Hannah was uh, uh, doing a great job of introduction. Uh, let me just quickly tell you in a few slides. Uh, I grew up uh, and was uh, educated in Wrocław and uh, did my um, pre-doctoral uh, fellowship in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, this is my university. Uh, we have a beautiful facility there, uh, the old and new mixed together. Uh, it is a fantastic place. I just started, I got my master's degree on organic chemistry at the University of Wrocław uh, <clears throat> before moving to technical university. And in my heart always, uh, University of Wrocław uh, will be uh, uh, closer uh, for some reason. Um, but that's where I started uh, my uh, education. Uh, and in 86, I came to America uh, to change, uh, change the world. Uh, I thought that uh, one person should be enough to, to do that. And yes, I look a little different than then, uh, um, but uh, really the energy and commitment to what we do uh, still persist. Uh, I started my lab in Portland. Uh, this was uh, a, like a preschool uh, for starting your own lab. I had two years of uh, very um, supportive environment uh, to build my lab and to learning how to uh, operate uh, before we moved to the University of uh, Washington uh, in Seattle, uh, a beautiful university, very dynamic university with a lot of great ideas. Um, many good people and uh, points of discussion and uh, strong uh, vision uh, research group uh, where I spent uh, almost 15 years. And from there on, uh, for no apparent reason, uh, we were attracted to Cleveland 
And I thought again uh, to build um, uh, something extraordinary in terms of the department and larger organization than my own lab. And uh, this is uh, Cleveland Philharmonia. It's a beautiful uh, a few things in Cleveland. Uh, and clearly uh, we moved there not because of the burning river. Um, as you can see, this is when the EPA started. Uh, there was a, a lot of uh, waste in, in the uh, rivers uh, that feed to Lake Erie. Uh, but uh, things changed, things changed for much better. And now Lake is clean and uh, uh, one could enjoy it, um, um, the water activities. Um, I spent there again about 13 years uh, leading the department and we make a great inroads into uh, becoming one of the best pharmacology department in the country. And the last phase of my career, I just would like to focus on the discovery that we made over time and uh, to um, uh, spend less time on, on designing of labs, hiring people, and uh, all of those administrative things, uh, which are to some degree enjoyable and again, uh, allowing to build a larger group. But at the end of the day, uh, taking a lot of energy and uh, we moved to the University of Irvine uh, when we started the Center uh, of uh, Translational Vision Research. And what we would like to do is again uh, with those uh, 20 or so uh, very intense uh, uh, experience in uh, vision, understanding of fundamental processes, understanding of pharmacology, uh, we would uh, like to translate that into uh, a, a real benefit for uh, patients. Uh, we have incredibly strong ophthalmic uh, department here with a uh, um, really large number of clinicians uh, who are involved in treating patients and that also allow us uh, to test it, uh, many of our hypotheses and that could change the, uh, the way how the medicine is practiced, both from pharmacological point of view and also from the point of view imaging of the retina. Uh, this is just outdated slide, but uh, to show you that a bunch of uh, young people, and uh, of course there are two Polish people here, Dominic and Alex, and uh, many international people we were able to attract uh, for uh, the, um, the research that we're doing in, in the lab. Again, there are very special women in my life, uh, and I would be amiss to not mention Mama, and, and of course my uh, wife, uh, Grazuna. Uh, we will be celebrating our 42nd anniversary uh, this year. And again, I just uh, 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 together, I think we produce uh, quite uh, interesting uh, uh, young scientists. Uh, here is Greg and Michael. Uh, both of them, so the all four of us are PhDs. Uh, Greg uh, is biochemist, Michael is computational scientist, and my wife is uh, imaging uh, uh, professional. So she she does optics and new imaging instrumentation. So uh, there is yet another woman, uh, and I'm glad that my wife is not uh, here listening to it, uh, that make a, a great uh, impact on my life. And this is right here, Marie Curie. Uh, she was really pursuing her pa uh, patient, pa uh, uh, passion of uh, discovery. And uh, all, all of us can learn so much uh, from her achievement. And um, really, she remains my um, biggest hero in science, uh, and here is their visit with uh, Professor Harding to um, uh, to United States. I have copies of original pictures from that time, a, a large number of photographs, uh, uh, really, uh, of this uh, incredible scientist um, that is again very close, and I treasure. Uh, everything I learned about her and how he, she approached uh, to science. So our vision, of course, is uh, quite complicated. And I would just give you a few snippets of, uh, uh, of our visual system. I mentioned to you already that we can operate uh, with a single photon detection and we can operate at very large uh, fluxes of light uh, up, up to uh, 100 millions of photons per second. 
And these uh, two processes uh, that allow us to do our light and dark adaptation. So when we go to a dark room uh, or poorly uh, lighted uh, um, room or a car in this case, uh, you barely can see it, uh, the features of uh, that particular environment. But when you stay longer, uh, you start seeing with the same light illumination, you start seeing things uh, with the be better clarity. And that process is called dark adaptation. It is one of the uh, features of our visual system that deteriorate with age. So as we age, our dark adaptation time is longer and longer and longer. So typically for a young person, uh, this change from a virtually uh, invisible to visible uh, environment will take about 10 to 15 minutes. And for those who are more mature, it will take uh, maybe 40 minutes to an hour. And this is also a sign, uh, sign of the progressive retina deterioration. So retina is built uh, with so-called post-mitotic cells. Those are cells that they develop once in lifetime, and if they die, they die, and there is no replacement. Only in very few species, like in fish, retina can uh, rebuild, but not in humans. And about 0.1% uh, per year, uh, we're losing our cells spontaneously without disease. And that process could be uh, enhanced um, by uh, a disease, by mutation, by environmental exposure, particularly to very strong light illumination. So just remember, always work sunglasses. This is the best cure to protect your visual system. So here is this device. It's a very simple device that measures dark adaptation. And as you can see, we have like two phases of dark adaptation. One, which is much more uh, rapid, and then the slower process of uh, the generate of uh, recovery of ultimate sensitivity. And you can see that it's independent of the light intensity. The both processes are happening. The first is related to cone cell regeneration, and the second is to rot uh, recovery from strong illumination. There is yet another adaptive process called light adaptation. So if we expose uh, momentarily our eye to the strong illumination, we still see the features of the landscape uh, in front of us, but it is not as sharp. And it takes a while before, again, we can now see the details of the same. And so this is called light adaptation. So we um, changing our visual sensitivity over time. And this process is relatively fast. So depending on the light uh, intensity, but uh, it is fundamental process that enable us to drive, let's say through the city with uh, more and less uh, illuminated areas, our eye ad adapt to this light condition momentarily. Otherwise we will be blinded by the light for a long period of time. Only in extreme condition, uh, what we will have is uh, this uh, blinding moment that it will take a few seconds before we're recovering. But in more continuum light illumination, uh, we are capable of um, distinguishing uh, the features much better once our eye adjusts to the background illumination. I would like to just mention a very few things uh, today. Uh, one of them is a, a single monogenic disease called liver congenital amaurosis. Uh, it was uh, discovered by a, um, Professor Lieber, who was a chairman of, of ophthalmology department uh, in Heidelberg. And he was interested in a population around Heidelberg where he collected um, uh, the blind people and uh, talk with them and describe many of the blinding diseases. Uh, congenital because it's from birth and amaurosis because he noted that the eye become um, darker uh, over time and uh, that's why uh, from Greek it comes as a darkening of the retina. It is fortunately a rare disease, um, but many of now treatments are available to those patients, uh, which is really something that when I started working in this field, uh, nobody was talking about restoration, but now we have a gene transfer 
the first FDA approved uh, treatment of this disease. And that also there is a pharmacological um, uh, way of treating that, uh, that uh, condition. It, as a uh, aside, uh, what I wanted to say that I have visited um, Heidelberg and uh, the ophthalmology department and they had a very nice, uh, a little bit uh, left uh, alone, a kind of museum-like uh, place uh, where the manuscripts of Lieber were uh, presented there. And uh, I start flipping through them, it's really with grand, great enthusiasm. And then noted uh, that uh, many of them had the uh, spastica stamp on them, uh, not to burn. So uh, you could just see this again, um, change in history, a great scientist, uh, and fortunately his manuscripts were not burned during the Nazi time, and they were allowed to survive, and we can see them today. So why are we interested in those rare diseases? And, and primarily because we can learn. We can learn about the way we can uh, treat it, uh, the way how the um, visual system will respond. And so we're starting with uh, generating, uh, nowadays the most popular is the mouse model uh, that allows us to recapitulate genetic lesions, which uh, again are um, uh, related to to uh, those patients of that particular condition. And this is relatively simple. It's a missing one gene typically, and uh, you, you, you understand the biology of that. Uh, there's a lot of years of study, what is the function of a particular gene, and it comes from those mice study, in vitro studies, it comes from a studying patient that provide you a basis, a clue, in a way how you're going to approach uh, to treat those diseases. Uh, yet another way, uh, very popular lately, it is to study dogs. And, and the reason for that, that um, those are inbred uh, animals, um, they also um, are severely affected in many cases uh, through their visual system. And uh, uh, veterinarians were collecting the samples and now the genetics is relatively simple uh, to identify the lesions uh, that are responsible uh, for a particular disease. And as it happened in humans, also in dogs, uh, you will find uh, the same lesion, the genetic lesions, uh, which will now recapitulate uh, the human condition on a large animal uh, compared to mouse. So both are, are very viable approaches. And you can see here uh, uh, this uh, dog called Mary. Uh, she uh, is blind. Uh, she has the same problem uh, that uh, occur in the liver congenital amaurosis uh, patients. And again, you have in panel B uh, the uh, condition that leads to that um, uh, uh, retina disease. Uh, namely, lack of one of the enzymes which makes the chromophore for our vision. And we have characterized uh, both proteins in a quite extensive way. We are aging and there's nothing we can do. Uh, all of us, uh, every day, it's a, it's a day older person. And our visual system also deteriorates with time. And it shows this, what I mentioned, the contrast sensitivity, dark adaptation, uh, the device that I showed you that can measure that. Uh, we're losing our visual acuity and our recognition of color become lesser uh, with time. Uh, there are two major pathologies and those are now multifactorial diseases. Uh, it's not as simple as the liver congenital amaurosis. Those are the diseases that affect the front of the eye, like cataracts. And the good news about cataracts, it's about 10 minutes procedure that the um, cataract lens can be removed and replaced. There is still problem uh, with cornea, which is also um, could be subject of transplantation, but it's not as uh, accessible like cataracts because it's just simply a replacement with plastic uh, that uh, focuses light on the back of the eye. And then we have this very complicated disease called age-related macular degeneration. And, and it's many, many factors that affect um, AMD. Uh, it is clearly a, a now a leading cause of blindness. It causes central vision. And um, 
patients will never get completely blind. They will have the peripheral vision. They will recognize that room is under light condition or is in uh, darkness. Uh, then uh, this they will be able to tell. But uh, unfortunately, um, it is progressive disease that will uh, prevent uh, facial recognition, reading the books, uh, as you heard on that movie, uh, from the person who had rotten cone dystrophy, so affected the central and peripheral retina, so even more severe uh, disease. There are two forms. Uh, one is called dry form, uh, and about 90% of the patients will have this dry form. It forms those uh, drusins, uh, this yellow, uh, yellow spots in the back of the eye, and the other characteristic will be this delayed dark adaptation. So this is really still untreated disease. Uh, there is no uh, any experimental um, drugs approved by FDA. Uh, all is still uh, on the level of research. And we have a pretty good idea where we would like to take this and what kind of treatment uh, could be applied to uh, stabilize vision in those patients. There is also a, a atrophic uh, and um, a wet form of the disease, um, uh, which I will talk about in a minute. But eventually, the central part of the retina de completely um, degenerates, and there is no tissue to be light sensitive to provide uh, uh, with sight. There is also wet form, which uh, causes the grow of the vessel inside to your eye. Uh, there is something wrong. The um, brain senses there is not enough oxygen in the eye and uh, start building new vessels that penetrate the eye and they are not normal vessels. They will break down and leak blood and causes hemorrhages in the eye and that leads to uh, blindness. So uh, this is uh, now a very much treated disease. Uh, there are three drugs approved, uh, Alia, Avastin, and Lucentus. Uh, they required a, a, week, a monthly injection into the eye and stabilize uh, in most of the patients, not all, but in most of the patients' vision. Uh, this is truly a miracle now uh, that those patients really retain the sight uh, for decades, uh, unaffected by the underlying disease. So, um, we're going to develop AMD, all of us, as we're on this uh, phone call, uh, all of us will be affected by the age-related macular degeneration. The question is only how long it will take to develop this disease. Are we going to be alive uh, long uh, enough to, um, uh, again, have those changes in the retina? Retina takes about 12% of the oxygen that we breathe. It is extremely active metabolically tissue. And so to support retina, uh, this very, very active throughout the life, uh, we need um, uh, different approaches to stabilize it that will prevent the degeneration. And one of those approaches is again, ph pharmacological uh, treatment using uh, um, known pathway in the retina called GPCR signaling and you had in this little movie explanation what this all means. So uh, this is the directions that we would like uh, to take. We would like to find uh, using a novel imaging technology as well as uh, fundamental understanding of uh, biochemical processes of, of photoreceptors and uh, underlying RPE cell, uh, understand the genetics uh, to treat a very common disease uh, such as uh, age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and glaucoma and others. Uh, I have been tremendously fortunate uh, to working with great people uh, throughout my career and those youngsters, uh, 24 of them established their own lab and they are in the big world and now uh, competing with us and uh, supporting us and uh, providing new ideas into the field uh, involved in this whole process. And many uh, also came uh, from Poland. I would like to acknowledge here um, Janina Buczyłko, who really was instrumental when I started my lab, and uh, uh, Wojtek Gorczyca, 
Wojtek uh, came to my lab and uh, I didn't know anything about him personally. Uh, he was a fantastic scientist. He got faculty position in, back in Poland. Unfortunately, he had congenital heart problem and soon after uh, he passed away. So um, that's my little story. I have been blessed with uh, support from varieties of uh, organization, primarily from National Eye Institute. I have been funded uh, since um, 91, uh, where I, uh, or 90, when I received my first grant uh, and uh, still going very strong uh, with several multiple grants supported by the Eye Institute. Uh, from a startup from University of Washington, uh, the grants from general medicine, research to prevent blindness, fighting, uh, foundation fighting blindness, and my um, uh, now current institution, Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. Uh, Gavin Herbert uh, was a pharma, he is a pharmacist. He worked for his father in uh, LA and uh, convinced him one day that he should uh, start doing research rather than to mixing uh, chemicals that his father was selling in pharmacy store. And that led to uh, starting a, a company called uh, Allergan. Uh, Allergan uh, was funded by Gavin Herbert, uh, now uh, went through several different owners and uh, very recently AbbVie uh, purchased uh, that company and uh, they are all located uh, at least in ophthalmic uh, uh, division here in Irvine, uh, which is yet another uh, a good reason to be around here and uh, to um, work directly with the industry. Because ultimately our discovery that we do in the lab, uh, they can be written, they can be published, and that's what we do. This is our profession. Uh, we, uh, educate the students, but again, to make a dent on the market, you need uh, to find a sponsor who will um, take the discovery, test it, and then uh, produce the product that is safe and effective. So today, uh, to introduce a new drug uh, in ophthalmology, it is a, um, a very expensive proposition, and that's why you have to, again, involve industry not for our own sake, but the, again, for supporting the project that you want uh, because of the cost of the drug goes from about 100 million to about $600 million uh, to bring new entity on the market. So this is extremely expensive uh, proposition to do that. And of course they need to make money to recover that uh, particular uh, investment. And that obviously is also uh, uh, quite a barrier to overcome uh, to convince them that the idea that you have uh, is the, the best idea and that they will be successful. But ultimately their success is the success of all of us uh, that we would have uh, something that is now enabling us uh, to um, treat uh, particular disease in our case, of course, ophthalmology. So I will stop here and stop sharing the screen and uh, happy to answer um, any questions you guys have. And uh, if I don't know, I will tell you that. Thank you, Professor. I have two questions that, uh, that arrived. Uh, one from Miriam. Are the majority of mutations causing blinding diseases, frame shift, like inversions and deletions, or ones with expanding trinucleotide repetitions? Yeah, so uh, virtually all of them. Uh, so we have a, a single point mutations. We have uh, deletions of chunk of the gene. Uh, we have also the uh, glutamate extension. That's uh, one of the diseases. So anything that has been discovered in biology has been proven to be also present in the, um, in the retina. A mutation in the genes, mutation in um, uh, promoter regions, so-called, in the gene, a mutation in intronic sequence, uh, and uh, right now the non-coding RNA uh, become a very uh, important area of research to find uh, whether there is a mutation in any of those cons blindness. 
So um, the answer on that question is that virtually any genetic lesions that you know from any other system, uh, I, I can assure you, you will find it in, in the eye. Um, in, eye has about 12,000 genes. Uh, so out of 28,000 or so, 26,000 of genes, 12,000 are present in the eye and expressed there. So uh, many of the diseases, uh, which is, for example, a very interesting diabetic retinopathy, uh, that in, in many cases, your manifestation will be, of course, a lower glucose. And if you control that, and the rest of the body will be less uh, uh, prone to, to defect, uh, only maybe a kidney from some cases, but it's very frequently that you have an ocular manifestation. And the reason for that is again, that um, the eye is so uh, metabolically active. It's perhaps more active than any other tissue in our body. And so for example, mutation in the adiponectin receptor uh, is virtually silent throughout our body, but it causes retina degeneration. Okay, another from Carolyn. Are you aware of any research projects to treat Stargardt disease? I have two nieces, sisters with this condition. We are hopeful that something will be available at some point to treat the, this, this disease and help restore their vision. Thoughts? Yes, so Stargardt disease uh, is affecting the central part of the eye and it really resembles to some degree of dry form of AMD. So Stargardt disease is a mutation uh, in 98% of the cases uh, in gene called ABCA4. Uh, this is the ATPase-driven uh, process of transporting hydrophobic uh, vitamin A uh, through the membranes. There are about um, 300 or so uh, well-documented mutation in this gene that leads to Stargardt disease. The, the other small fraction of the patients with Stargardt disease, they have um, mutation in gene called LOV4. Uh, this is the uh, gene that uh, uh, produces a long fatty acid in the eye. So um, what has, has happened in the last decade in Stargardt disease uh, is the natural history of disease has been very well described. So uh, multiple centers throughout the world, uh, Hopkins, uh, uh, Basel uh, in Switzerland, um, UCLA, virtually every center contributed to this project to understand the degenerative processes in patients. So we call it natural history of degeneration. And this has been now very well done and I will just tell you why this is so important. Stargardt disease is juvenile form of macular degeneration. So I mentioned to you that as we age, we will develop dry form of AMD or wet form of AMD almost for certain. This is juvenile in first or second decade of life, or maybe sometimes in third decade of life, the central retina become degenerated. So uh, it is a relatively fast progressing disease as compared to AMD, but yet it's slow disease. So it provides the window of time when the treatment uh, can be evaluable. Now, if you go back in the different technologies that were developed uh, to treat that diseases, you wanted to know whether it's effective. And so based on that natural history, we will be able now to go to those patients and try multiple treatments uh, uh, and to figure it out which one will be the most effective for those patients. Now, what happened on the research side, uh, there are several, uh, including companies, but a, a lot of very, very good labs working on gene transfer. So um, can we replace the, the mutated gene that is not functional? Uh, the problem with this, uh, that the only way in humans right now to deliver genes is adeno-associated virus. And that virus only has so much capacity and no more. You cannot put a, a lot of DNA into that virus because it will not be made. So you, 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 there are many different interventions uh, that were made to split the ABCA gene into fragments, two fragments, and then use AAV. And those studies were shown to be quite effective in uh, mice 
uh, that were treated. And the clinical trials are ongoing. I, I know uh, at least about two. One in uh, London, in the um, East Eye Institute there, and another one uh, in France uh, through a company. But there is also a pharmacological approaches uh, that were invented and they're in process of clinical trials. And in clinical trials, you have those three phases. The, the phase one is the toxicity. So whatever we do to the eye, we cannot make it worse. We cannot make it worse by any means. And so that's the phase one that determine the safety of the treatment. And then phase two um, um, is the, the time when you expand the number of uh, uh, subjects that you can have a clinical readout. Um, and then the phase three that it goes to independent centers that uh, use the treatment uh, to validate that uh, it's really effective in different populations. In terms of the specific question, uh, what is going on in the Stargard disease? As I mentioned, it is extremely active area of research. Uh, I have written one article um, that was a summary of a meeting that we had in Cleveland. So in Cleveland, we brought in all of the people working on Stargard disease. And then summary of this meeting has been published in IOVS, that's the visual uh, sciences journal and uh, again I, through Eva I can happy to share the reference to that. That will bring you almost up to date. This meeting has been held about two years ago uh, and there are some further improvements and incremental progresses in the standard uh, Stargard disease. So this genetic approach, this pharmacological approaches, there are several of them and uh, we're also gearing up uh, to do our own clinical trials using those GPCR ligands, which we believe will be a very effective in stabilized vision in those patients. Is okay. that uh, sufficiently detailed? Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay, another question from anonymous attendee. In uh, 2016, at the age of 63, I was diagnosed with chronic central serous chorioretinopathy and executive macular degeneration, uh, both in my left eye. No one seems to know the cause of the central serous. One doctor said it's genetic, another it is caused by stress-related stress related cortisol. Can you share your thoughts on this and on the safety of eff efficacy of RETs? Yes, uh, so uh, here we have, uh, from what I understand, and just keep this in mind, I'm not a physician, I'm not going to treat you, there are people who specialize in that, we're on a, on a research side. Uh, because it is uh, only happening in one eye, it is more likely to be non-genetic. There is no reason why it shouldn't be biocular. Uh, in this case, so it's more likely to some induced stress. Um, the uh, only treatment for the uh, atrial-related macular degeneration of dry form, and the treatment is a little bit misnomer here. The only prophylactics that is used is a bunch of vitamins, uh, selenium, uh, carotenoids, and some other mixed, uh, you will say a super vitamin, pill uh, that um, uh, statistically improves the odds of developing age-related macular degeneration. But it's not a treatment, and I hope you understand that. And it is really um, only uh, the treatment that is only visible when you study hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. So if you take a two population, 100,000 people here and 100,000 here, you treat one group uh, with, uh, with those uh, super vitamins and other not, you will find the differences on the rate of developing the disease. Individually, it is almost um, ineffective in a way. Uh, so because again, the um, only a big numbers can give you a, a little bit of improvement. If this is improving your vision, wonderful, and then you're lucky among very, very few. Uh, if it uh, doesn't, uh, most likely it's not harmful. 
um, because those are relatively safe um, vitamins and components that we daily in, ingest. So um, saying all of this, uh, I think that uh, genetics is extremely important. And right now, uh, the genetics tests become much, much less ex uh, expensive and can be done in multiple uh, centers. Uh, we call it a CRIA approved centers. So those are the centers that um, are uh, federally regulated and so they are accurate. Uh, that one should uh, try all of the panels of different genes uh, to be tested. Uh, there is nothing again wrong, except of uh, it may cost a little money. Maybe your insurance can cover, um, but uh, it, it is always strongly advisable to do a genetic test regardless. Okay. Uh, two questions, I think, from Drek. To my understanding, current research towards treatment of optical degeneration has followed two main paths. Pharmacological intervention to mo modulate the pathophysiology of disease to slow or prevent its development, generation of pl pluriponent stem cells to replace lost cells with NI NIH funding. Both approaches, both approaches, can you speak at a high level towards the merits and limits of each approach? Yes. So, um... Optic nerve is, of course, critical. Uh, this is the only uh, one of the two diseases that uh, if the optic nerve is cut, either because of the uh, injury or because of massive degeneration of optic nerve, like the end state of glaucoma, in both cases, there is no communication between eye and brain. So nothing, no perception of light. So uh, in terms of uh, pharmacological uh, uh, intervention, uh, this seems to be a little bit, um, uh, it could come a little bit sooner to stabilize optic nerve. There are several good ideas on the market that people are trying at different stages of development um, that could prevent um, astrocytes being degenerating. That it, it's just simply that will stabilize the optic nerve and uh, one of the most important is to control intraocular pressure. Uh, so like in glaucoma, uh, that <laughs> this is one of the uh, readout of problems that could lead to optic nerve degeneration. Now, uh, there is a, a, a really a push uh, for, uh, for progenitor cells and uh, varieties of those progenitor cells that can be used to restore uh, nervous system. And those are um, very early, uh, very early in, in development. The good news about these uh, pluripotent cells is that they are usually derived from the same patient. And so there is no toxicity to be associated with and it quicker can be studied. But the way of integration of those new cells into the visual system, it's the biggest hurdle. Uh, how are we going to rebuild retina? How do they know where to go? How do they know to function uh, for uh, a cell that is missing? So I think this is more, uh, it has to be invested more resources to, to do this type of research, but this is a, a decades before it will become practical. Okay, a question for Muthurman. Uh, will it be possible to test for inhibiting those proteins using natural product? Of course, the discovery of the drugs uh, could come from a variety of approaches. And uh, one is the um, unbiased screening of active compounds, and they could come from natural product. And this has been an extremely useful approach in the 80s and 90s in pharmacology. Uh, people will travel to Amazon and bring extracts from different barks and trees and leaves and all of that and will be tested because they contain the, the, the chemistry world is virtually unended. You, 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 can, you cannot imagine that you will have all molecules in your hands. That's just not possible. So you're looking on shortcuts, how you can take the natural product and screen them for a particular 
um, disease or particular, uh, um, you have to develop a particular assay for that disease that you can screen multiple compounds. A natural product are one of them, um, just chemical library of any compounds uh, derived from a synthetic chemistry can be tried. Uh, all of those things are in repertoire of pharmacologists who are looking for the ligand. And more intellectual approach is the structural biology that allows us to uh, crystallize proteins to know what are the shape, uh, to understand what they bind and how they bind a ligand, but particular ligand to understand how they operate and how we can inhibit. A great example is again when Polish crystallographers contribute to HIV infect infection and the protease uh, that was coming from crystal structure of those proteases and now we have a manageable disease, chronic disease, but manageable uh, from the uh, developing of those drugs that inhibit protease essential for life of this virus. So um, th there are many approaches. This is just only one. Which one is better? Um, I will not even venture to that answer. Each of them uh, have its own advantages and uh, should be tested. Okay, question from Vladek. Uh, you recommended dark glasses. Anything else related to metab metabolism that you also mentioned? I think that the most important are really to protect our eye from light. And this is something that uh, my mama was telling me not to um, uh, read in, uh, in, you know, when it was dark and uh, turn off light and go to bed. And then the argument that you can get blind and, and really from light illumination, you cannot get blind. Uh, you may develop a uh, muscle spasm around your eyes uh, if you read in a not enough light condition, but it is helpful. So uh, this is number one that to protect our eye, particularly from a very sudden light changes. So uh, if somebody goes uh, from the dark uh, house uh, outside and there is a very sunny day, that initial phase generates a lot of toxin. And I can elaborate on that, but it will be too much chemical. Uh, there is a lot of toxin generated. So using uh, sunglasses is critical. And the other uh, things, again, uh, related more to metabolism in the eye uh, is anti antioxidants. And those are, again, mostly can be delivered by natural products uh, that will have the property uh, of quenching uh, the act, uh, active uh, radical uh, species. Because in the eye, you have three um, places where this become very important. Number one, it is the highest oxygen pressure present there. So you have a lot of oxygen. And this is how a photoreceptor gets their energy and there is no vasculature around the, the photoreceptor. So you have a lot of uh, high uh, tension of oxygen present in the eye. Then you have light and you have a high turnover of metabolism. So all of them are again speaking to a tissue that is in very high metabolic demand. And uh, the byproduct of that demand, it will be the uh, oxidative species, uh, which are detrimental to our DNA, to our proteins. And anything that reduces that is a good approach. Okay, a question from Adam. Any treatment for a lazy eye, please? Hmm. This is a little bit outside of my uh, knowledge. I only know that uh, peripherally, um, uh, and maybe I shouldn't uh, speak uh, because it's better to, to uh, know what you don't know and not to be dilettant uh, to speak about this. But um, saying that, and, and with this preamble, uh, they, they are still the best, I guess, the surgical approaches uh, from what I know. And uh, there are, again, new concepts that I am aware of uh, that could uh, lead to stimulation uh, of the eye in a very specific way uh, that could be as a part of the treatment. But this is more related to front of the eye. And uh, we divide it on those who are uh, on the front and on the back. And uh, I'm more interested in the part. Okay. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, as we spend more and more time in front of the computer, how can we keep our eyes healthy? 
I think that the amount of illumination from the computer now, I hope everybody has flat panels. Uh, the, the amount of light that is coming from those computers is, is not a major issue. Uh, the, the, the controversial study, uh, but there was an article in, I think, Washington Post or New York Times. Uh, I, I'm saying one of the two, I, I remember to be interviewed by them too. Uh, uh, there is a, a, some people believe that this is a bad thing uh, that happens that you watch to continuously. I, I don't see the, any evidence of that, e even in a very deep literature. Um, that, uh, of course, the earlier monitors were much more um, dangerous and toxic. Uh, this one are not. Uh, there is a cutoff of the light at very short wavelength, so you don't see that. It's protective for blue light or UV light that is not causing much trouble. Uh, the problem uh, with staring is, is more uh, on the proper uh, blood flow to the eye because we're sitting in front of the computer, we're reading all day long, uh, is the posture, the, um, the flow, like I mentioned. Um, those are the more severe uh, affecting the eye. Again, taking into account that this is the most metabolic uh, uh, tissue. So the, the solution is relatively simple. Uh, I will not advise anybody to sit uh, all the time in front of the computer for hours. Uh, just take a, a walk around the house or take a walk around the uh, workplace from time to time. Uh, for the older men, it's no problem because they have to go around uh, more frequently. So that's also a good thing. Uh, so there's benefit of, of one or another. Uh, just, just to let the circulation of blood um, go to normal. This, this sitting, this sitting, staring, focusing, um, that part is really more detrimental than really on the visual system. Another question from an anonymous attendee. How does stress cause CSR? CSR, I don't even know what it is. Okay, so let's skip it. And probably the last question from Maria. Uh, what would be your advice for treat treatment of juvenile glaucoma? Is there any drug approach more preferable to other things to watch out for? So um, we call this in biology, um, in biology, we call this a system pharmacology. Uh, so a system pharmacology is, uh, is approach, pharmacological approach that you can come to a disease uh, that it causes a certain type of uh, problem inside the cell um that you can stabilize that process from varieties of different angles so multiple drugs uh, that have the same effect the advantage of doing this systems pharmacology is that you lower um lower uh, the dose because you uh, are going into the cell from varieties of different pathways let me just say this in a, in a simpler way. Uh, if you have a reservoir of water and you have a um, big hole that the water will escape, or you can have a thousands of little holes that the water will escape. And so the same about pharmacology. You can have those thousands of drugs that goes and, and stabilize the visual system, or you can have a one, but at much higher dose. And so now it is believed that it's more preferable uh, to use multiple drugs uh, that uh, are used to stop the progression of the disease. And, and that call, uh, in the past was called uh, polypharmacology or um, uh, more precisely called a systems pharmacology approach. It's perhaps better for, so for those youngsters that uh, have a glaucoma and they're entering the field, this approach is better. So with this long uh, and whiny answer, uh, the modern drugs that have multiple active components are perhaps uh, would be my preference if I would have to take it for glaucoma, that will uh, lower the, the uh, intraocular pressure. And so any of these newer uh, drugs that are on the market, that would be preferable. Oh, I just noticed Dr. Dajinkiewicz uh, wants to add something. In reference to the name of Marie Curie Skłodowski uh, by Professor Palczewski, 
I would like to uh, mention that uh, Kosciuszko Foundation hosted Maria Curie Skłodowski when she was visiting New York City. And there is a letter in uh, archiva of uh, Kosciuszko Foundation of the Maria Curie Skłodowski to the president of the Kosciuszko Foundation. Uh, this is uh, an inspiration for uh, young scientists who are, uh, in case of Kosciuszko Foundation, uh, receiving support from Kosciuszko Foundation, that uh, in their memory, uh, Maria Curie Skłodowski, definitely the most uh, decorated Polish scientist in terms of achievements in science, double uh, laureate of Nobel Prize, uh, I think is is uh, worth to remember and add in reference to our uh, today's um, presentation by Professor Palczewski. Thank you so much for a very interesting uh, presentation and the lecture. And of course, the recording of this lecture will be available on our uh, YouTube channel, which is called Kościuszko TV. So thank you so much. Thank and you. All. Join our upcoming events. Thank you. Thank you very much.